I'm Dan Rosenzweig, CEO of Chegg. Let's break in. Yo, 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 this is Ruben Harris. I'm here with the homies, Archer and Timor Meister, and this is the Breaking Stars podcast. Timor, can you please tell the people what we're doing today? Yeah, so it's a Monday morning, and we're recording out of Santa Clara, and what's interesting is we we always break into startups, and we ask the guests to invite us to their offices so we can check out the office, get some video clips, uh, and kind of get a vibe of what it looks like. Today, we're actually recording... Um, on top of a live chess board. So we're surrounded by live chess pieces. And if you wanna tune in and check out the video footage, we now have eight heroes that's also recording the podcast. So you'll be able to check it out on YouTube. Uh, but I'm really excited to speak to the guest. Um, he's uh, the CEO of one of the first uh, large tech companies that we've interviewed. And Ruben, can you please introduce him? Yeah, so um, some people will call Chegg a startup, but you know, many of you know that have been following them will know that Chegg is actually a large public company. And we're here with the CEO, Dan Rosenswag, who was also the CEO of Yahoo. He was the CEO of Guitar Hero and is on the board for several amazing companies. And we're really excited to be here today. Shout out to Mark for the introduction. Um, and before uh, going into his story, well, let's just start off by saying welcome, Dan. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to Chegg's Global Headquarters. But I just want to make sure for those of you looking at the video, mm -hmm. they're large chess pieces, not live <laughs> chess pieces. <laughs> so we do not employ people to move on the chessboard. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> good, good segue, good segue. So for the people that don't know, what does Chegg do? Um, and what are your thoughts about you know your focus now that you're here? So Chegg was created with a very simple premise in mind, which is young people are overburdened, they're overtaxed in terms of their time, the things they need to do, the costs in their life, and nobody has put students first. Mm -hmm. Everybody has put the institution first, the publisher first, the professor first, the administration first, the hours when you program classes. So if we could build a company that puts students first, mm -hmm. what would we do? So everything we do is designed to help students decide, should they go on to further education? And if so, what would that further education be? What is the cost of making that decision in terms of time and money? Mm -hmm. How do we save them costs? And so we created the textbook rental business. Mm -hmm. And then once you're in a class, how do you master that subject? How do you pass the class? Mm -hmm. How do you learn it? How do you understand? Because there's no really such things mm -hmm. as teacher's hours anymore. And since 70% of kids go to state schools and 40% of them are working 30 hours a week or more, how can we build products and services that represent where they are in their life? And, um, and then how do we get them an internship and how do we get them a job? Mm -hmm. And so everything we do, our desire is to save them money, save them time, help them get smarter, mm -hmm. and to accelerate the time and reduce the friction between learning and earning. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great um, introduction to this episode and um earlier during the pre-chat we noticed that um in your bio it said the beneficiary of the american dream for a lot of people when they think about the american dream education is a part of it um student loans are at an all-time high um people are thinking about whether people should go to college what are, what are your thoughts about the future of college is that still a part of the american dream should people be thinking about alternatives or what are your thoughts about that so it's a fabulous question, and it's, of course, a loaded question, <laughs> because whatever <laughs> I say, someone's going to be upset with me. But here's what I believe, and here's what Chegg is learning from working with uh, more students. We, we, we believe we have the largest network of direct-to-student learning anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is based on what we learn from students, what we're actually able to observe what they do, mm -hmm. how they do it, the time of day that they do it, where they struggle, where they don't struggle. Mm -hmm. You can do it by 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 textbook, by class, by professor, by gender, by region. So we have a lot of information available to us. And what we believe is this. 80% mm -hmm. of kids go to college for the purposes of getting a better job. 50% mm -hmm. of high school kids don't go on to further education. And they're going on to jobs that automation is likely to eliminate in the next mm -hmm. 10 years. Of those that do go on, 
43% of them don't graduate. They graduate with $9,000 in debt on average. Wow. And of the ones that do graduate, they graduate with $37,000 in debt on average. So I would say in any scorecard you look at, that is not succeeding. Right. So what we believe is that if you can use technology mm -hmm. and what the internet does best, which is make something on demand, mm -hmm. make it downloadable, mm -hmm. personalizable, can um, adapt to who you are versus what you think you are mm -hmm. and be really cost effective, mm -hmm. then we ought to be able to make education less expensive, more available, more affordable, more relevant. Mm -hmm. And that like everything else we've done, so we no longer wait out in the rain for a car hoping we get it, we call Uber, mm -hmm. it comes to us. Mm -hmm. We no longer go to a movie theater and pay a lot of money for something we don't want to see mm -hmm. and eat popcorn we don't want to eat and sit next to somebody we don't want to know, we go to Netflix. Yep. Mm -hmm. Everything that is happening, even in terms of, of medical stuff, mm -hmm. we now have 23andMe and we have Everwell mm -hmm. and we have all these things and we wear clothes and watches and sneakers that are able to monitor what we do. Mm -hmm. So if everything else in the world is coming to us, mm -hmm and being more accessible, more relevant, more affordable, and more accurate, why are we still going to education yeah. right? instead of education yeah. coming to us? So mm -hmm. we believe an increasing number of Americans who don't have the time, mm -hmm. don't have the money, we ought to be able to bring learning directly to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. an amazing answer. And um, I know that Chag is also focused on you know, careers and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about what you all are doing related to people after they've gotten the skills and how they navigate the workforce? Because that's a whole different skill set. So it's another part of technology that's really fascinating, which is data mm -hmm. and big data. Mm -hmm. So what, what data scientists look for and what you can use AI and computer learning for mm -hmm. is finding patterns, recognizing patterns. And once you recognize them, people can make better decisions as a result of them. Mm -hmm. So we've gone back and we've looked at over 100 million resumes over 10 years of, of college grads. And so we can now tell a kid, if you go to Emory, where you went to, yep. and you take this major, mm -hmm. you're gonna acquire these skills that an employer might want. Mm -hmm. Here are the eight employers that are likely to hire you. Mm -hmm. Here's how much they're likely to pay you. And here's how much the person that's gone there, how long they've actually stayed mm -hmm. there. So by using data, mm -hmm. we can find patterns and help people make better decisions. We believe it is our birthright and our responsibility to help a student get their first job mm -hmm. and to make that first job a job they're likely to succeed in yep. and be able to get it faster and with less stress. So we are working with students and employers to use all of this data to mm -hmm. build pathways to help a young person understand, if I do this, this is what's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. If I change it and do this, this is what's likely to happen. The same token, we go to employers, and we say to employers, you wanna learn how big the pool is for the kinds of people that have the capability mm -hmm. to do the things you want. You wanna learn what region they're in. You wanna understand the value of diversity. Mm -hmm. And so our data, because our platform is so large, help employers, grow their pools and start looking at kids in schools that they historically never might have looked at mm -hmm. because we can identify that those skills that they have. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to be able to do is help you pick the school, pick your class, pick your major, master the subject, pass the class, get an internship and get the right job mm -hmm. and then identify the gaps in your skills and then eventually help you level up on those gaps. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And um, we're definitely going to talk about your first job and how you got up to this point. And, you know, a lot of times how people are switching careers and sometimes it seems like an accident. But before going into that, we also know you're on the board of Adobe. You've mm -hmm. invested with some of our guests like Mission U and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, what are your thoughts about programs like Adobe Digital Academy or boot camps and things like that? Well, I think we're living in a world now where technology's impact is ubiquitous mm -hmm. and it's unstoppable. So everything Chegg tries to do, and we, and we do some of it extraordinarily well, and we're trying to get better at some of the other things that we do, is that we bet on the inevitable. So we don't know the day the inevitable is going to happen or exactly the pathway in which it's going to happen or what sequence it might happen. But let's just be clear. 
if you think about the jobs of the of the present and of the future, mm -hmm. are they going to require people to understand technology more or less? Probably more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that everybody can or should be or wants to be an engineer. Facts. Right? I have I have two daughters. I forced my first my oldest daughter to go to General Assembly to learn programming. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rachel, what did you learn? She said, I learned exactly what I thought I was gonna learn. I said, what's that? She goes, I hate programming. <laughs> and so that is not what yeah. she wants to do. Totally. If, if you look at a company like Chegg that has now a thousand employees, mm -hmm. the overwhelming number of employees that we have are something other than an engineer. Mm -hmm. But if you wanna build a business, you wanna build a product, mm -hmm. you wanna learn how to market, you want to be an analyst. You want to be in finance. You better know how to use certain things. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be in sales and you don't know how to use something like Salesforce, that's a real mm -hmm. challenge for you. If you're going to be a creative type or a marketer or a photographer mm -hmm. and you don't know how to use Adobe Photoshop or mm -hmm. subscribe to, you know, to their creative cloud, you're going to be limited in the number of places that you can be successful. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a marketer and you don't understand data science and analytics mm -hmm. and how to go into the database and get the data, mm -hmm. all the brilliant ability that you have to think through won't be available to you because mm -hmm. you won't even be able to see the data. Yeah. So yeah. my view is that these things are necessary. They're valuable. I think they ought to be taught by schools. Mm -hmm. I think the mistake is it's not instead of liberal arts. It's mm -hmm. not instead of what you learn. It's addition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to what you're learning because that's how we get it together. When you think about liberal arts, you know, rhetoric, uh, rhetoric was one of the big categories. Critical mm -hmm. thinking is one of the big mm -hmm. categories. All necessary. But what is rhetoric today? Well, if you don't know how to use Facebook or Instagram, um, then you don't, know how to ha you don't know how to communicate. Yeah. Those are the speaker's corners yeah. of today's generation. Yeah. And so from my standpoint, it's just inevitable. The same way I had to learn typing or how to use a calculator when I was growing up. People today need to know how to know what the technology skills that, that they have to have. It doesn't mean their job is to be an engineer. Yep. It just means you need to appreciate what an engineer does. You also need to get access to the content and the data and the analytics that you need. And you also need to be able to use modern day tools, mm -hmm. right? We no longer do a mailing through the post mm -hmm. office and hope to get two and a half percent, you know, return on a direct mail like we did in magazine publishing when I started. Everything now is, is CRM. So to avoid the necessary skills seems like a, a, a totally. waste of time. And yeah. you mentioned something in your intro, like how the number of people that drop out of high school, of college, folks who are um, performing jobs that may not exist in 10 years, mm -hmm. and how like today's technology, um, it's definitely there's definitely a learning curve, but by gaining those tech skills, you're giving yourself job security, and you're making yourself less replaceable. And like Timor and I, we went to coding boot camps, and even though we had successful jobs, we still felt like we needed to uh, obtain the 21st century literacy, which is knowing, maybe not necessarily how to code, but at least understand how technology is built. Um, and so we recommend a lot of our listeners to at least um, study how like popular apps that they use on day-to-day -day basis, how they work, because um, that's going to give them insights and maybe even better ideas or business ideas they could pursue. Um, they could pursue in their life. Um, in your case, so you've mentioned like kind of the importance of liberal arts, but there's also um, kind of people are switching careers multiple times during their lifetime, and a lot of the time, the first job you get out of college, like in our case, it was finance. Um, it's probably not going to be the job you're going to have in 10 or 20 years because people. Um, master the skills, they find other things they want, want to learn about. So how do you see education evolving beyond just the first job, but also like your second, third job, and refining that fulfillment um, in your career? Yeah, th so I'm 57, so that mm -hmm. what, what is different is it, the, your generation is extraordinarily different than mm -hmm. the expectations that we had. So I stayed at my first company, or my yeah. second company, after yeah. I got laid off, the first <laughs> company, for 17 years. Wow. And the only reason that I left is because we spun out a division, took it public, and it got acquired. Yeah. Otherwise, I probably would have stayed yeah. for even a longer yeah. time. So and that's that was so the expectation. Different. That's so different to today. Absolutely correct. And and so, but there are universal skills mm -hmm. that you could benefit from knowing. Mm -hmm. Communication. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Critical thinking. Yep. Mm -hmm. And language. But today's language is technology. Yeah. It's not Latin like yeah. it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And so, understanding those things, but 
I think if you just asked somebody, if you didn't call it tech, mm -hmm. and you said, would you like to know the nine things that every employer wants a young person to have when they're going to go take a job? Yeah. And if you could get better at them, would you? I think everybody would say yes. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to use Office 360, mm -hmm. you're not going to be very good in finance. Yeah, right. Because if you can't master an Excel spreadsheet, yeah, yep. it doesn't matter how smart you are, how critical your thinking is. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you can't organize the information, you're of no value. Yeah. Right. If you're a creative type and you can't use Adobe, yep. very little value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, from my standpoint, I think we should take away the stigma of calling it tech because I think people confuse mm -hmm. that with coding yeah. or that you're going to go into a mm -hmm. technology job. Yeah. You're going to go into a job, and it's going to require mm -hmm. you to learn and use the processes and systems that are available. Yep. Yep. And all of them are predicated on technology. Yeah. 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 Um, now, in terms of your other question, mm -hmm. I believe based on my own career mm -hmm. and based on what I see from the millions and tens of millions of young people that we work with and my own two daughters and their friends, life's very serendipity. Mm -hmm. So when I go back and speak at my college, they say, Dan, did you always know you were going to run uh, a company like Yahoo when you were chief operating officer there. And mm -hmm. I was like, in 1983, they hadn't invented the internet, mm -hmm. <laughs> a cell phone, broadband, data. Yeah. Um, we barely had a computer. It was much bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I got a C in the class. Yeah. <laughs> so the answer is the world keeps going. Yeah. The world keeps evolving. And if you want to participate mm -hmm. and grow and have the opportunity to experience many things in your life, you are going to have to keep investing in yourself. Fat is. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. Not. Yeah, and I think um, I think you touched. You made a lot of great points. Um, I think um, when it comes to high school kids picking their majors or picking careers, uh, a lot of it comes from parents. And uh, I'm uh, personally a mentor to kids in um, Oakland through iMentor. And what I'm seeing is that um, not only like are a lot of people, uh, a lot of parents not involved in terms of guiding their kids uh, and preparing them for the future of careers, but the ones that do, they kind of push their kids towards roles that might have been popular 20, 30 years ago when they were going through those stages, like civil engineering, um, like be becoming a doctor and be becoming an, uh, like a, a, an investor banker and all those things um, used to provide job stability and the financial security in the past but nowadays the narrative has changed so how do we um, convince the parents and how do we educate the parent so they can um, position their kids for a better future well I have to argue a little bit with your premise I don't think there's anything wrong with pushing your kid to be something like a doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, or even those other professions, yeah. to be honest with you. I think the point that you guys make, the one that, that resonates best with my audience, mm -hmm. and I think with myself even as a parent, is you, wanna, you want your child to understand mm -hmm. that the world's changing. Mm -hmm. And the pace of change is different than it was when we were growing up. And that jobs that once seemed... Uh, inevitable and secure are no longer either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, given that's the world they're going to grow up in, what we shouldn't do is limit them to a single point of view, yeah. mm -hmm. but rather allow them to experiment. It's like the same thing with athletes. The best athletes that I know, and, I, and I'm very fortunate to know a bunch of them that came out of Stanford and play in the NFL, every one of them, whether it's Andrew Luck or Zach Ertz mm -hmm. or Kobe Fleener or David DeCastro, mm -hmm all these big time NFL players, every one of them will tell you they played multiple sports growing up, not just one, mm -hmm. and football wasn't even necessarily mm -hmm. their favorite sport, mm -hmm. right? So Zach was basketball, Andrew was soccer, uh, DeCastro almost went to the Olympics for swimming, even though he's 330 pounds, so I asked him if he was going <laughs> as a buoy. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but you know what, what you learn is you've got to keep evolving and learning, and mm -hmm. you've got to be able to recognize that whatever you pick now, may not be what you're going to be doing later because it may not even be around. Yeah. And that's just a fact of life right now. Yeah. 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 Um, so, can I just, uh, so I, I definitely realize that, um, like tech is not only the answer obviously and the, there's other professions that um, can pr provide that job security i think what we're seeing with a lot of our community members is a lot of them um, get on the path let's say to become a doctor and go through med school and they start realizing that uh, the process takes like 
like six to ten years for them to get into a uh, get into a place where they can get that job security where alternatively we see a lot of people with computer science degrees r right out of college getting jobs at twitter making like s stupid amount of money as their as a new grad salary like 130 base plus bonuses and all that other stuff so i think um it's valuable f for for parents who realize that uh you can be making um a good uh, like stable salary when you're out of college um like it, it's no longer just that um no longer just going into the medical field or law or finance there's other paths where you can get there sooner but th the parents haven't uh, caught up i guess to the trends of the future so anything particular that you think parents should pay attention to or should read or should check out well look i again i think what we need to be careful of is di people have different lenses mm -hmm. they have different desires they have different skills they have different uh, goals in terms of mission-driven companies, non-mission-driven companies. You mentioned Mission U. Yep. Chegg is a very much a mission-driven company. Twitter is a mission-driven mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. But so is being a doctor, and so mm -hmm. could be being a lawyer, and so yeah. could be being a social worker in your community. Yeah. So f for, for everybody, they need to evaluate what will bring them the greatest joy if they're mm -hmm. successful in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what does it take to be successful in it? You can't you will never become successful if you don't focus and put in the time. Yeah. And so the message to parents would be that the world of opportunity has evolved dramatically since when we were first picking our professions. Mm -hmm. And so now you can open your eyes and, and help your child understand that there are many ways to contribute to society, to earn a living, and there are jobs that used to pay high that maybe don't pay as high as they used to because of whatever reason, those industries evolved. Mm -hmm. And so if you take a look at lawyers, uh, 20 years ago, 50% of kids got into law school. Yep. Today, 90% of kids get in. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because half as many people are going to law school, yeah. <laughs> right? So yep. it, it's, what I would say to parents is the same thing that my kids tell me I'm supposed to say to them, which is it's their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let them make their own mistakes. Yeah. Let them find their own path. But if they're going down the path of understanding the impact of technology and what it can do for the good and how they can contribute, that those are very high paying jobs that can last a long time and they mm -hmm. shouldn't they, they should be considered as as important um, as the other jobs that they that you might have been considering for them. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great answer. And given that, you know, Chegg kinda like had this philosophy early on or like this issue growing up where um, you know, in order to get a job, you need experience, and in order to get experience, you needed a job. And a lot of people that are coming out of and college, so people know that's where the name Chegg came from, which yeah. is which came first, the chicken or the egg? Oh, yeah. wow. College is really expensive, mm -hmm. so in order to afford college, I need a job. But in order to get a job, I need a college degree, yeah. which came first, the chicken or the egg? And yeah. that's the name Chegg. And a lot of these people are graduating from college, from alternative forms of education. They're trying to figure out again how to navigate mm -hmm. and even before the job, now companies are thinking about apprenticeships and internships. Um, how do you think about apprenticeships and internships? Um, do you think that more companies are gonna start creating them? Do they have to create them? Um, just because there's a lot of job openings. Well, look, here's, here's what we do know. You're, the statistics show that you're substantially more likely to get a paying job mm -hmm. almost immediately upon graduation if you've had a paid internship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's to your advantage to have one. You don't have to have one every year. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even have to be one at the kind of company you're gonna end up working at. Mm -hmm. But what an internship can do for a young person is help them evaluate company size, company culture, job responsibility. How am I supposed to dress? What time do I come in? Mm -hmm. How do I talk to people? Mm -hmm. How do I work as a team? Mm -hmm. what, what, what is, how do I use email and Slack and all of these other things yeah. as opposed to, you know, live in your world through emojis? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> although all of our interns have taught us how to put emojis into our communication. <laughs> so, uh, so we both learn from each other. But we take 34 interns a year here uh -huh. um, because we understand the importance of it to the young person and the company benefits mm -hmm. because you get new thinking and new energy and creativity and you learn what your future customer base might look like. Um, so I think every company should offer to them and I think every company should pay yeah. to offer them 
uh, assuming they can afford to pay. Not every startup that you talk to can take yeah. in. But the, the experience is invaluable mm -hmm. for, for practical reasons and, and mm -hmm. soft reasons. Yeah. Um, and I also think that apprenticeships are really valuable. So if you look at today, if you look at manufacturing, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm recently invested in a company uh, called um, Cluster Inc., which is working on modern day manufacturing. Mm -hmm. okay. Most young people never think about that. Mm -hmm. And so apprenticeships have a lot to do here because there's apparently something like 250,000 manufacturing companies in the US. Wow. There's 12 million jobs. There's been a million new ones created in the last year mm -hmm. and a half or so. Mm -hmm. 750,000 of them go unpaid. And they're actually for, for high paying technology driven manufacturing as opposed to only working on the manufacturing floor which historically was what it was for yeah so you know when when you look at where things are going you can apprentice at some of these companies and never having imagined it before yeah mm -hmm. and so from my standpoint any opportunity you get to find yourself in a job environment take it yeah and you can learn what you don't like as much as you can learn what you like. But most people end up being successful finding a culture and an environment that gets the best out of them. So there's no, you know, there's lots of people called dream jobs, but jobs are jobs. They're hard. Yeah. And they're not always fun every day. So the way you fight through that pain is to be in an environment in which the people you're working around and the mission you're on are worth fighting for. Yeah, no, I think that's a great segue into like, you know how you got your first job because I remember we kind of faced this conundrum where you know I I was you know investment banker working with Archer and Timor we knew tech was taking over everything we knew we wanted to start something in the future and we had to have a diversity of skill sets so they decided to be software engineers I realized that wasn't for me so I learned I decided to do sales and I think you decided to do the same thing so can you tell people how you you know started in your first job yeah so uh, the first job Look, coming out of a liberal arts college in 1983, um, uh, unless you were, you know, unless you knew the profession, if you're going to a real estate or finance or, you know, going to Wall Street, one of those things, or consulting firms, I was clueless. Mm -hmm. But I knew that um, I needed to be self-sufficient, and the best way for me to be self-sufficient was to depend on my own abilities, which meant sales. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I went looking for sales jobs, and then unfortunately, at the same time I was graduating, my mother was uh, getting divorced, and so I was knew that you know that I was going to be more out on my own than mm -hmm. I originally planned, mm -hmm. and you know that was fine. It just was unexpected at the time, so I took a job that paid more, and the job that paid the most was eighteen thousand dollars a year, wow. going to work for a great company called Pitney Bowes Dictaphone, who was selling this new technology. Speaking about technology back in '83. <laughs> called word processing okay and you're all too young that are listening to this to know that word processing used to be a machine not a software package <laughs> and um you would go into these companies if you were selling them and you'd literally go elevator to elevator door to door office to office to convince them that they needed word processing <laughs> so i was very excited i was told my first day that i got the highest uh, score on the exam that they'd given people and i was ready to go and i thought i was going to make money and then they said, uh, sit down, have bagels, meet everybody, enjoy yourself. Two hours, we have a company-wide meeting. And I went up to the company-wide meeting, and they announced that Pitney Bowes Dictaphone was going out of the word processing business. <laughs> and then I and 998 of my other fellow employees were wow. being laid off. Wow. Wow. But it shows how serendipity things are. Because mm -hmm. the company that I didn't take, that I actually wanted to work for, but it paid less at the time, and I thought mm -hmm. I needed more money. So it's a good lesson for me. Mm -hmm was a company called Ziff Davis mm -hmm. Publishing Company, uh, founded by, uh, I think, one of the greatest publishers of all time, Bill Ziff. Mm -hmm. And they really helped create the whole concept of special interest publishing, like your podcast yeah. mm -hmm. is special interest publishing. But they were flying, boating, running, uh, uh, skier, mm -hmm. skiing, road and track, you know, all these kinds of things. Psychology Today, Stereo yeah. Review, for any of mm -hmm. you who know what a stereo is. Yeah. They didn't name them Alexa at the time, but stereos <laughs> used to play music. So I had interviewed there and gotten a job in, in ad sales. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be classified ad sales to all these really cool magazines at the time that all my friends knew. And so that's a pretty cool thing. And I went in two weeks later. I called them up the day I got let go. And they said, absolutely want you. you were, we were disappointed when you didn't say yes. Come on in. When can you start? And I mm -hmm. said, well, very busy guy. I could start in two <laughs> weeks. Because I took my severance pay and I went to trip to Europe. Wow, yeah. smart. Um, smart. <laughs> yeah, well, I went to Europe and came back. 
and I couldn't wait to start my new job in classified advertising for all these amazing consumer magazines. And I walk in the door, and I'm, I'm told, I asked for the people that interviewed me, and they said, well, I got good news and bad news. Mm -hmm. The bad news is none of those people work on these magazines anymore. Dang. The good news is they all still work at the company, and they're in a new division called the uh, Creative Computing Magazine Division, and so you need to go find them. So I walk in, and all the people that had hired me to do classified advertising were now in the circulation department of a new division for computer magazines. Wow. So instead of selling advertising, I was literally, my first job was taking the yellow pages and looking up and finding small mom and pop computer retail stores. This is before there was any of the super stores. Mm -hmm. And convincing them to carry 10 magazines for resale. And that they could make 35 bucks a week if they did. Wow. <laughs> so that's what my college education went for. Yeah. But the lesson for me, again, was things are never what you expect them to be. You have to be able to adapt to the situation. You have to have a good attitude. And you have to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so it started that way, but it turned out to be the most fortunate thing that's ever happened to me in my life professionally because computers became big. Yep. I continued to work my way up through the company, and 15 years later, I went from the telemarketer to the CEO of the internet division mm -hmm. wow. when no one even knew there was an internet until the 1990s. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the world keeps evolving. You got to stay in the game. You got to stay focused. You got to keep performing. You have, a good, have to have a good attitude. And if you think you can structure mm -hmm. your life and your choices, it's the old famous Mike Tyson quote, which is, we all have a plan until we get punched in the face. Yep, and, yep. and I got punched in the face two times in two weeks, and it's turned out pretty darn great for me. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then you also grew up in, in New York. So can you kind of talk about like how that affected just like kind of like your mindset and your upbringing? I know you talked a little bit about your family, but how did that shape you know what you were doing? Well, family shapes you all the time, good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you learn the value set from your family. And, and what I'd always learned was education mattered. Mm -hmm. And my mom was a public school teacher, and so were uh, many of my aunts and uncles. Mm -hmm. uh, my father had left when I was a young age, so I also learned the dependence of the greater family, grandfathers and grandmothers in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but I also learned that there's a lot of things I'm going to have to do on my own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. New York, which... You know, I live both in New York and in California. New York is like no other place on the planet, and mm -hmm. um, I think it prepares you to compete and to challenge yourself and to grow. Um, and Silicon Valley allows you to think outside the box and outside the norm. Mm -hmm. So growing up in New York, it was always... If I took a job, how do I do it 10% better? And mm -hmm. how do I stay at a company and work my way up the whole time? And you have to go through this this mm -hmm. uh, structure. Yeah. Whereas in Silicon Valley, when I met people like Jerry Yang and David mm -hmm. Filo, the founders of Yahoo, and Jeff Mallet, mm -hmm. and they didn't ask, uh, how did the person do the job before me? They said, what needs to be done and what's the most efficient way to do it? Yeah. And I was like, huh, it's a completely different <laughs> way of thinking. So the balance between the competitiveness and the challenge and the speed um, and, the, and the diversity of New York combined with the creative and new way of thinking and the importance of technology of Silicon Valley and really the importance of turning young people loose, yeah. which Silicon Valley is very famous for, putting those three things together I think is a, is a much more complete picture and has allowed me um, to stay relevant even at 57 years old. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And how do you see, so you've brought up technology and how it's changing industries, but specifically in education, which is the industry you guys are in, and you've mentioned that you guys are putting customers first, where traditionally in the education system it was the schools or the publishers. So how do you see technology changing the way uh, students are prioritized by companies and the system, and where do you see that going in the next five years? Fantastic question, and, and the truth is when we said student first, which was almost mm -hmm. eight and a half years ago, mm -hmm. which I put on the bottom of an email sort of randomly, mm -hmm. because once we started doing textbook rental and once students started to write in and say, if not for Chegg, I never would have gotten textbooks. If not for Chegg, mm -hmm. I, couldn't have take, I couldn't have taken two courses, I'm only mm -hmm. taking one. Yeah. So we have so many community college kids. I realized that our job is to put the student first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Chegg had an IPO uh, 
almost five years ago, four and a half years ago, that didn't go particularly well. We did we priced at twelve fifty. First trade was eleven twenty five. First day close at nine sixty eight. So you want to talk about humbling? Mm -hmm. I could talk about humbling all day long. <laughs> yeah. um, and doing that on CNBC and in front of my daughters and my wife is not my finest um, <laughs> proud moment. But the stock dropping all the way to three dollars and fifteen cents, people didn't think that they needed to change. Mm -hmm. Now that the stock is over thirty, mm -hmm. and that that Chegg reaches. Um, you know, nearly half of every college student and 25% of them, we believe by the end of this year will be a paying customer mm -hmm. and that they use our learning services at on average once a week and they're consuming over 200 pages a semester. Mm -hmm. People are beginning to wake up to the fact mm -hmm. that the system is not designed to serve the modern day student and the modern day student is actually 25, not, mm -hmm. not um, 18 to 22. 25% of students actually have a child already. Mm -hmm. They're working. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether it's four year or two year. And fewer and fewer are going to residential colleges because of the time and the money. Even if you went to a community college, it's an hour commute there, an hour commute back, 50 minutes or an hour for the class, that's three hours out of your day yeah. to, mm -hmm. to learn one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the, I think the impact of, of Chegg's success on the industry has been to show that if you make the content and the information mm -hmm. available, affordable, personalizable, and adjustable to the way the student actually wants to learn with multiple modalities, mm -hmm. video, text, mm -hmm. human help, mm -hmm. we don't choose for you. We don't assume one is better for you. Mm -hmm. We assume that you may need all the different kinds depending on what you're studying. Yep. And the fact is the majority of our studying happens after nine o'clock at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from our standpoint, we think that technology should have already had a much greater impact mm -hmm. yeah. because it's difficult to do anything at scale in mm -hmm. an individual school, mm -hmm. but technology allows you to do so. It allows you to make content available all hours, not just the schedule hours. Yeah. It, makes, uh, it gives you the ability, we do online tutoring, we have hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of tutoring sessions for as little as 50 cents a minute. Yeah. Most of those things are at midnight, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because people work, they have lives, they have families. And so I think the impact is schools are gonna to need to adjust to utilizing technology to the advantage of their student mm -hmm. base. And when they do, their student base will expand, they'll learn more, they'll be able to take greater amounts of curriculum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you go to a residential college, 95% of the time at the college is not in a classroom. Yeah. There seems to be a lot more learning that people can do. Yeah. And, and our view is like Netflix, if you can binge watch my favorite show, yeah. mm -hmm. then I ought to be able to binge learn my education. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for four years or two years. Yeah. Totally. If yeah. I'm willing to put in the time and the effort and the energy and I can master the concept, why can't I go be LeBron of the workplace and just yeah. go right from right to the yeah. job? Exactly. I think it's also important to, to highlight team. We talked about team, you know, got Mark in the room, got other people in the room. How did you go about choosing your team? How did you build your team? What do you look for when you hire people? You know, it, it's first of all, I'm very fortunate because at the level that I'm at, mm -hmm. anybody that I get to interview has already had success and already has skills. So what do we look for? We look for chemistry. We look for attitude. We look for people who believe that success is a result of what we collectively do, not what an individual does. So I have been so fortunate that my team mm -hmm. has fundamentally stayed together for the entire eight years that I've been out here. Wow. So I've had people work f with me over three jobs in more than 10 years, wow. and I've had um, I've had my banker, who was a junior banker when I took the job, then went back to business school, took us public, and then joined us. Nice. Right? So, so my management team has been here almost as long, or in some cases a little bit longer than I've been here, and we've stayed together. And what we learn is nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be great at everything. Yep. But if we believe in each other, if we trust each other, if we communicate with each other and we let the people that are supposed to do what they're supposed to do the way they're capable of doing it, not the way I'd like to see them do it. Yeah. Because the way my lens is very different than the people that work for me lens. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have that level of communication and that level of dialogue and that level of trust mm -hmm. and they believe that, the, that we're going to work to get the best out of them and they're trying every day to get the best out of this company, it tends to work. And yeah. so every great, everybody that wins rarely wins based on themselves, even in individual sports. Mm -hmm. 
you always hear, whether it's a gymnast or whether it's a tennis player or whether it's a race car driver, you always hear them thank their team yeah. because mm -hmm. somebody coached them, somebody yeah. practiced with them, somebody yeah. taught them something, somebody read them the riot act when they needed to have it read to them. Yeah. Every one of us succeeds as a result of a lot of people who play a critical role through many parts of our lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Can you can you highlight some of the roles that that play a uh, integral part in making the product happen? So a lot of the users, they might be using Instagram or they might be on your website today and they might think it's just the founder and 10 other people building it. But we know that there's thousands, if not there's hundreds of people in, people in each role making products happen. So can you just highlight the different roles that come together to um, provide the experience that you provide? So it's very interesting that it's a it's a terrific question and and I have a good friend who uh, was chairman of Bain and then he stepped down from that to become the president of eBay and then eventually became the CEO of eBay and PayPal and he retired and now he's the CEO of another company again because he's he's just phenomenal at it. But what he says about technology companies that are really interesting is that to this to the consumer, everything you do needs to be invisible. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know mm -hmm. how many groups or teams work together. Mm -hmm. So the front end looks to look, needs to look seamless and the back end needs to be seamless. Financial reporting and data mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. infrastructure and privacy and, and protection and all of those things. Mm -hmm. It's that messy middle where things could go wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we always say if our student believes we have more than one line of business, we're not doing it right. Mm. So any particular product or service, anything that we do is gonna to have to have people in strategy, people in HR, people in product, people in engineering, mm -hmm. people in marketing, mm -hmm. people in research, mm -hmm. people in communications, people on the back end infrastructure, mm -hmm. people in security and data security, and financial systems and financial payments, and then the people in the legal department. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can go through QA, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, customer service. Mm -hmm. yep. Every one of these people mm -hmm. has to be working towards the same end goal. And so what we learn in, in modern day business, it's, it's about being transparent, having a mission, having a North Star that people can focus on. Because if, if, we, if everybody believes we put the student first, mm -hmm. then a lot of the normal discussions and politics that go on in companies get reduced because the question simply becomes how is this good for the student yeah mm -hmm. yeah no i think that's so that's been breakdown. very helpful for us as a yeah. tool yeah no i think that's amazing breakdown especially because of your location you all are here in south bay san jose is down the street i saw people that are in here that i don't think are employees here i think you guys do tours here sometimes or do you are there how do you think about like a lot of the roles you mentioned people yeah. do that aren't in quote-unquote tech like look we we we're we do a lot of things because we feel like um, it's our responsibility to learn from, listen to, and then build for young people. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of tours of young people. We have a lot of, we, ha we have research and panels. We have 16,000 students that are impaneled wow. that, that uh, help us can know everything from what they think fake news is to what products or services they use to what do they think of our product or service. Yeah. Uh, we also have, you know, uh, focus groups that come in here mm -hmm. and we also have lots of kids from the boys and girls club or from different diversity groups, mm -hmm. um, uh, from San Jose or from San Francisco or from any of the local areas, whether they be people of color or Hispanics, uh, or, uh, kids who are going to be the first in their family to go to college. Mm -hmm. We welcome all of them both mm -hmm. as employees and as people who can give us feedback because we're serving them. So we're very fortunate, um, to be able to, to have so much access to different people. But we also teach them that every job is not an engineering job. Mm -hmm. Then when you walk around here, mm -hmm. you know, we have everything ranging from facilities. You're looking mm -hmm. at one of the most beautiful facilities. That's our facilities people. We have HR people. We have communications mm -hmm. people. We have marketing mm -hmm. people. We have finance people. We have legal people. We have QA people. Mm -hmm. We have research people. Oh, and we also have tons and tons of the most fabulous engineers. We yeah. also have 32 <laughs> day scientists, uh -huh. right? So, so there is an opportunity for people to work at Every modern day company is going to be somehow impacted by, hurt by, fueled by, or succeed as a result of what's going on in technology. You just need to be aware of it. Yep. And, and young kids, they grew up with it. Everything they do is on the phone. Everything they do is an app. They, it's not as intimidating to them as it is to their parents. Yeah. yeah. Sure. 
Uh, so at this point in the podcast, we do the lightning round, and this is where Arthur and Ruben will ask you questions that are um, that are geared for our listeners, so they can take your advice and they can implement the strategies, tactics to get to where you are today. So Arthur, take it away. Yeah. So these are quick questions, quick, quick answers. Questions, yeah. Very strategic and tactical. All right, I so got my hand on the buzzer. <laughs> all right, let's do this. So this question takes us back to the basics. So imagine you just moved to a brand new city, you don't know anyone, and you're you only have a hundred dollars and you're trying to get back on your feet and break into tech what would you do and how would you spend that a hundred dollars well i would try my best not to spend the hundred dollars okay i would try to find a friend that i could live with mm -hmm. um i would find a try to find a company that uh, gives you free food which mm -hmm. you can't do in mountain view now <laughs> but you can do in in every other place and what I would say is this, look, when you're young, you could take the most amount of risk, mm -hmm. but you also cannot afford to risk to be homeless or foodless, which mm -hmm. is a very big problem in, oh, in yeah. San Francisco. Yep. So I would say the first thing you do is you don't move here unless you have some place to crash for a while. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then the second thing is you go find yourself into almost any job at any company mm -hmm. in the Bay Area mm -hmm. until you learn what it is you think you want to do mm -hmm. yep. and get some skills and get some, get some experience. Don't try to think you're going to know the right answer to the single most important question you're ever going to be asked yep. <laughs> uh, in day one of a new city. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there are 4,000 new startups a year in this town. So, yeah. so don't feel like any choice you make is also the last choice you're going to make. Yeah, yeah you got another game that you're playing. Uh, we talked a little bit about mindset earlier, uh, meditation, things like that. What's, your, what's Dan's daily routine? Well, it's evolving. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, look, believe it or not, you need to get a lot of sleep yeah. at any age. Mm -hmm. Two, I exercise a lot. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I go running a lot because it helps clear my head and, and just make me feel better. Three, I try to eat increasingly better. And as you get older, that becomes more important. Four, I quit drinking four years ago yeah. nice. uh, because I, I, I never, I've never met anybody who said at the end of their life they wish they had drank more or taken more drugs. <laughs> yeah. So that was a pretty good sign that, you know, as I got older, it wasn't, it wasn't the smartest thing to do. So my routine is I, I get up. I uh, meditate, mm -hmm. which is new. I've just started that. Nice. Mm -hmm. And um, I assume that the day is going to go well until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. I make sure that I, I, I've already known what it is I'm supposed to do that day. I'm already prepared for those things. Mm -hmm. And I come in with a great attitude and with an expectation. I greet everybody here because I feel safest and most productive and happiest when I walk in these doors. Yeah. Because yeah. the people you guys have walked around, you, yeah. you must have felt Some the great energy, energy on a Monday yeah. morning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also because we give a lot of free caffeine. <laughs> um, and then I go about recognizing that not every day is going to go as planned. Mm -hmm. Not every problem is going to be understood or solvable in that minute. And that the one thing you don't want to do is create drama mm -hmm. where drama isn't necessary. Yeah, mm -hmm. no yeah. drama. I no like chaos. that. Yeah. So this this question, it's about, um, I guess, your your biggest tr strengths. Um, you mentioned that when you first got the first job that you ever had was uh, calling on mom and pop businesses selling mm -hmm. magazines. And then in 15 years, you rose to become the CEO of that company. Um, what skill do you think contributed to that success? So normally in a podcast where they don't see you, I say my skill is my extraordinary good looks. <laughs> but since you're also videoing this, I can't say that. <laughs> people will know that pretty quickly. <laughs> but if I could encourage anybody, and I do with my daughters, and sometimes it drives them crazy because that's what parents do, mm -hmm. um, is you know their mom has taught them to be uh, to care about a mission, to have great values, to care about others, to succeed working with other people. Um, and to recognize and to be available to other points of view, to be willing to, to mm -hmm. hear other points of view, but also never devalue themselves, mm -hmm. right? They belong, in, they belong where they are and they should act like they mm -hmm. belong where they are. For me, the one thing that I've taught them on top of that is you will never go hungry mm -hmm. and you will never be unemployable if you can sell. Mm -hmm. And selling is about listening, it's about, it's about understanding, it's about empathizing, it's about having compassion, and it's about being able to communicate 
not the way you want to communicate, but the way the other person can hear what it is you're mm -hmm. trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time as they were growing up. We worked on presentations and speaking in public, and mm -hmm. and you know that was my price for having to go to every soccer tournament in every small town in the state of California. <laughs> was like, all right, if we're going to do this and get all the, we can listen to all the Taylor Swift you want, but we're going to pitch something. <laughs> um, and and so to me, it's about sales because if you, if you can sell then you have the ability to help people make a better decision that they should make that they otherwise wouldn't have known that they should make. And that's yeah. got to be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's amazing. And uh, just just wrapping up, you know, what's the best way for people to keep in touch with you? What are any final words you want to share with everybody? And, and then we'll close out. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all. Um, it's a real honor to meet you guys and to have the for opportunity sure. to participate. And obviously, most of your listeners either use or have heard of Chegg or know mm -hmm. somebody that uses Chegg. And so I have great gratitude mm -hmm. and appreciation for all of them. And the only thing I would say closing out is it's it's your life. The mm -hmm. sooner you stop blaming other people <laughs> and, the, and the sooner you own mm -hmm. your own choices, even the bad ones. Yeah. Because you're going to make them. Yep. Yep. There's a 100% chance mm -hmm. that you're going to make decisions, <laughs> even decisions you know you shouldn't have made. Yeah. You're going to make them. Yeah. Yep. And it's, it's about how do you recover from that? Mm -hmm. How do you come up, how do you liberate yourself from, from making that one again? Mm -hmm. And how do you find a way to make fewer of them? But how do you come back with a good attitude and said, every day is another opportunity mm -hmm. to move on the path that I want to be on? Mm -hmm. And so that would be, you know, that's what I learned, that's what I learned from my mentors, uh, where, I, where I've uh, had my greatest amount of failures, um, the greatest amount of achievements have come out of them. Awesome. And so the other thing I would say is what what Ashton Kutcher always says, which is you got to have grit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to have grit. You have to be here. Chegg was considered a failure for most of its first seven years. Okay. And eight and a half years later, we're three and a half billion dollar market cap company and considered a leader in our space because we never lost mm -hmm. sight of our vision mm -hmm. and our mission. And the team didn't quit on the student on each other, on me, I didn't quit on them, and we stuck it out. Mm -hmm. So grit and determination matters. Stay focused. Yeah. And so check.com, C-H-E-G-G.com, right. and Twitter, do you want people to tweet at you? Uh, no, no okay. they will, and they do. <laughs> <laughs> but you can find me under Dan Rosenswag on Twitter. Um, that's an open account. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, don't look for me on Instagram or Facebook. That is closed. <laughs> <laughs> Out here. So without further ado, yeah, let's, let's break, break in. in. Let's break in. <laughs>